exciting time to be a part of the Twickenham Church of Christ. A lot going on. Next week, I want to let you know that Justin and John Rieger, our new directors down at the Hacienda of Hope, will be here, and they're going to be here during the week and meeting with different folks and everything. We're excited. They're going to be with us, and I'm going to spend a few moments interviewing them and getting an update on how things are going down in Ecuador. So I know you want to be here to hear more about uh, their ministry and our ministry down there that we partnered with them. You also should have gotten a postcard in the mail about Advent. Uh, this is something that we traditionally haven't done, but it, it really is an exciting thing to make sure as we head into the holiday season that we're keeping before us the anticipation of the coming of Jesus and, and reminding our families what this season is all about. I promise you don't want to miss a single Sunday in the month of December. There's five of them. We'll be studying hope and peace, joy and love, and then have a, a special guest speaker on our final, final uh, Sunday of the year in between Christmas and New Year's. Well, Jim Vann sent me an interesting article this week about a startup church that had its inaugural uh, worship last Sunday. When they opened the doors, 400-plus packed people packed into a Hollywood, California auditorium. Well, the attendees, before they went in, enjoyed coffee and donuts in the lobby. And then as they, they filled in, the group met for, see if this sounds familiar, about an hour and 15 minutes. And they had upbeat music and an inspirational message and readings and reflection. And during the uh, uh, time together in the service, the attendees clapped their hands and, and cheered and sang rousing renditions of Lean on Me and Here Comes the Sun and other popular favorites. And there was a meet and greet like we had earlier during the, the service. And at the end, there was an invitation for people to go out and, and make their communities better and get involved in different service projects there in the Los Angeles area. And, and the final thing they did is they passed around uh, cardboard boxes for people to put in donations if they'd like to. Well, outside of the secular songs, what's the big deal? Another church popping up. Well, the big deal is this church plant was a church started for atheists. And in fact, there, there's a group that has raised over the past couple of months over $800,000 to plant these atheist churches around the United States. You're like, well, where? Well, it's the typical places, as you can imagine. It's Los Angeles, California. It's Santa Monica, California. San Diego, California. New York City, oh, and Nashville, Tennessee. It's the most recent that they're planning to start up. Yep, right in the middle of, of the buckle of the Bible Belt. Well, if you were to, after services today, get on Facebook and start looking around, and you discover that your niece or nephew, or, or perhaps an old family friend or, or maybe a college roommate, had wandered into one of these gatherings and, and was saying that it was the best thing since sliced bread, but what would you tell them is the difference, especially if they haven't been to church before, of, of, of that gathering and that group of people and what we have? How, how would you tell them and, and describe the truth that, that, that we have? Because after all, they're using our blueprint for gathering times, right? And, and they look like they're having a good time. They're obviously experiencing community that we're talking about. I mean, they're, they have relationships and enjoy being together. W what would you say? What, perhaps you, you'd start off saying, well, we have a mission, and we, we have the, the, the greatest command, and we have the, the great commission, and so these are things that, that guide our life, and, and so we have intentionality. We're on mission. Well, they could say they have a motto, and I have to tell you, it's kind of a cool motto. Live better help often, wonder more. Isn't that catchy? Yeah, that's their motto. Okay, um, well, of course, you would eventually have to point to Scripture and say, we have a Savior. Uh, everyone realizes there's sin in the, this world, and, and because of what happened uh, on the cross, because the Lord sent His Son, because He loved us so much, that transaction has taken place. And so we no longer have to fear sin and we know that, that God loves us tremendously. Sin is one and only son that to take place. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to the book of Romans because Paul lays out uh, very brilliantly exactly what we have for being united 
with Christ. See, in the, in the first 11 chapters, Paul unfolds the mercies of God. And the, the gospel message is, is kind of God's clemency to inexcusable and undeserving sinners. In, in giving us unto to die for us, we have been justified freely, right? And, and, and so that's no longer something that we're concerned with. And we're, done, we're justified through this sacrifice and through our faith coming together. And we're promised in Scripture a new existence. That we're going to be this new creation in God. In Romans 9-11 through 11 in particular, this comes out not by our desire and effort, but through Paul's key words in these first 11 chapters is mercy. God's mercy. And his purpose in, in Romans chapter 9 and verse 23 to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy. Who, who are the objects? That's us. He wants to extend his mercy to his children, those that have been called according to his purpose, and accept Jesus Christ in their lives. And so you see in, in this passage, both disobedient Jews and Gentiles alike are, are, are level. The, the playing field is, is made level, and that they're all in need of a Savior. They're all in need of the mercies of God coming before him through God's unmerited mercy. Flip over to chapter 11 and verse 32. Let's read that together. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. It's open to all that will receive him. That's the heart of our Heavenly Father. And praise be the Lord. That's the good news. That's the gospel message. We have a Savior. And to him be glory forever and ever. That's what separates us. We gather to celebrate what we believe. This group is organizing based on what they do not believe. It doesn't even make sense. We have truth, right? Game over. End of discussion. But truth is relative, they would say. And a savior from what? If you don't buy into sin, what do you need a savior for? There's no absolutes here. What may be be wrong for you may be right for me and heaven or hell i haven't experienced either one all i've experienced is this life and i want to make sure that this life works according to the way that i want it to work because we've only got one life so you can keep your truth i'm going to do things my way see in this day of skeptical people they're less convinced by purely rational arguments I got to reading some, some old commentaries and, and stuff from the lectures back at, at Lipscomb and, and Fried Harmon and other places. And they would have the, these public gatherings where, where people would throw out truth and make rational arguments, go back and forth. And people would listen to truth and kind of wait for themselves and decide, okay, well, that's what I want to be about. In this day and age, people aren't as easily convinced they don't want to know why Christianity is true. They want to know, is what you believe real? Does Christian belief and practice actually make a positive difference in the character of a person's life? I appreciate what Daniel Kaufman had to say. Is It's not just about presenting some type of truth in some. It's what is the difference? What's the transformation that's taking place within my life? Because we, if we lay claim to this life-altering promise of the gospel that we're being made into a new creation. People want to see it. They want to see that the truth that you embrace and the truth that we proclaim and trumpet, that is making a difference. That you teens are, are different than other people at your junior highs, middle schools, and, and high schools. They want to know out in the workforce, are you different than the person next to you in the cubicle? Because it's only fair to ask if a person lays claim to Jesus and their relationship with him, is it working? Do you exhibit more peace and less stress than the average bear? Are you handling crisis with more grace? Do we experience less fear and more faith? Are our lives lived more conscientiously and, and, and with boldness and conviction? Do people see that based on what we believe? 
Do, do our lives manifest more joy? Do people see us overcoming addictions and, and anger and compulsions? Can people see a growth that the trajectory of our life is moving towards something better based on this belief that we have? As much as, as we want to point people to the truth found in the first 11 chapters of Romans, they carry no weight without Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brother, in view of God's mercy. What we've been talking about for 11 chapters here, this is what God has done. This is what we have in Jesus Christ. Then offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So it, we're, we're kind of at a crossroads. We're at a turning point of the letter here in Romans. And, and Paul switches gear from, from presenting doctrine to introducing practice. He's like, we're, we're all in agreement with this doctrine, right? Okay, now this is what it's going to look like being played out in your life. He says, I exhort you. It, it's stronger than, than the NIV's urging. He said, in light of the mercies God has given us, which is incredible, this is how it should play out in your life. He said, all of us are called to be living sacrifices. We're, we're called to lay our lives upon the altar. But not, not like the animals of, of old that, that died and lost their life to, to, to atone for sin. Think of yourself more as Isaac. When, when Abraham laid it upon the altar, but God provided the sacrifice instead. Well, Isaac, as he's walking around, is a living, breathing testimony to the faith that Isaac had, and more importantly, his father Abraham had. He's a living sacrifice. And don't you know he had a story? Let me tell you about what your grandfather did one day. This is how much he loved his heavenly father. So we become this living sacrifice. This is how we respond. What does he say in verse 2? How do we respond? Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect world will. Transformed here, the, they use the same verb in, in Greek, metamorpho, that we get the English word for metamorphosis. <clears throat> it's also used in, in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus is transfigured. His appearance changes, and, and they're, they're amazed as they watch him change in and reveal his glory before them. And so this idea of changing appearances, I'm going to warn you this is a little creepy, but just go with it. <clears throat> Jill came in last night, and she said, people are going to think you have a Messiah complex. I said, no, that's not it. We ought to be morphing and changing into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That ought to be what people see. That each year we become more and more becoming like, like a God in the things that we do. What's the difference between church and any other organization of people, atheists or otherwise? We're a transforming community. And people ought to see that if you're part of the Twickenham Church of Christ, when you come in and when you leave, and as you go over the course of, of weeks and months and years, your life begins to change from being united with the Twickenham family. That's what's different. Moving people from the patterns, priorities of the world to the ways and will of our Heavenly Father. That's what it's about. The only other time that this verb is used is in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. You're welcome to flip over there, but... Keep, keep your finger here in Romans chapter 12. Here's what I want us to do. I, I want us to read this together. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's what it's about. We're to be this transforming community. That's what's supposed to be happening. We're supposed to be looking different. That's the what? Transformation. Okay, so if, if that's the goal, that's the what, that's what we're striving towards. How do we get to the how? Show that to me. 
where does that come from? How do we get to this how? If we profess to be Jesus people, we need to be living Jesus practices. That's what all these couplets that, that Lincoln and, and Alan Mann were doing together. What, what Paul is saying is, a lot of times we can look at, at the teachings of Jesus in his life and just say, wow, that, that's incredible. Loved it. I'm going to admire it. No, Paul says, I'm going to reintroduce some of these themes to you because you're supposed to be doing these things. If you're going to be Jesus' people, you've got to be following Jesus' practices and doing some of these things and putting them into motion. That's what he's talking about. So we're yielding our lives to become more like Jesus. What's the how? Well, the, the last part of 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. For this transformation comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's a God thing. It's His Spirit doing the work within us. Okay? It, and if that's true, that He's bringing about this transformation, that gives us the power to live in this world differently to walk away from the ways of the world, to start getting into a pattern and, and a path that God is putting us on, his trajectory. With that in mind, let's return to Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. For by this grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given to you. This is each one of us has one body with many members. These members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion with his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. And if it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Okay, you see what, what's going on here. We have acknowledged that if the growth, this transformation is going to happen, it's going to come through God and his powers, not of our own. And it's the spirit living within us. But how do we do this? Because okay, we went from this whole conversation about us being more and more like Jesus through the power of the Spirit. So why are we suddenly talking about church? What Paul is saying is life and community is the hothouse for this growth and transformation. It's the greenhouse where, where, where things start taking place. But if I've got Jesus and I've got the Holy Spirit, right? Do I really need the community of the church? Because I tell you the truth, I, I don't really do groups. I don't do people all that well. Can I just kind of slide in and worship for a little bit? And according to this, the answer to that is we've got to have community. The transformation takes place within the context of the church family. Transformation takes place in community. The, the Spirit doesn't hand out box lunches. That at the end of service, you kind of take and, well, I'll go and I'll allow God to kind of shape me and mold me on this. He passes out ingredients that we all put together. So think, think of it this way. You don't go into the cupboard and, and get a big scoop of, of shortening, do you? No. And you, you don't uh, get, get out some baking powder and take that. And, I mean, even eggs, unless you're rocky, you're not going to do that. But if you mix it together with cocoa, you mix it together with flour, and you mix it together with sugar and put it all together, hand me a piece of chocolate cake. That's the way spirit works. We're all given different gifts that are ingredients that get put in to one body, one fellowship. So we're all gifted in different ways. We need everyone's gift in order for it to work. You know, some of the best preachers in our brotherhood that I've met are extreme introverts. They just camp out in, in their study, and that's what they do. But there, it's not someone you'd feel comfortable going to for, for counseling or encouragement. And some of our strongest servers here in this fellowship, if you're going to ask them, would you go teach? Like, no, no, I, I'm going to do this over here. And, and some leaders are fantastic, but you wouldn't want them on the front lines showing mercy to folks. 
And some of our most generous contributors want no part of leading the church. They're like, let me just do my, my thing. God's gifted me with, with making a, a lot of money out of it. I will help to, to help finance this mission, but don't ask me to, to walk away from this to go serve as a leader within the church. Transformation takes place within the context of community. Sometimes it's hard being dependent upon others for their gifts. It just is. So what does Paul say? He said, before we get into this, you've got to talk about your heart. He said, don't think too highly of yourself. You know, pride is going to keep you from two truths. Here they are. Number one, you cannot grow into who God intended you to be apart from community. I didn't say apart from attending worship. I said apart from living in community, knee deep with folks, day in and day out, wrestling together with brothers and sisters, uh, working on, on texts together and serving alongside one another and, and doing life and talking about raising kids and talking about dating relationships and all these things. Other people have gifts that you have to have that, that are within the body of Christ that you will be deficient upon if you're not in the body of Christ. If you're not a part of the community, which is sometimes messy, you're going to flounder without them. In the early 90s, in the heyday of the Dallas Cowboys, God's chosen team, just humor me. There's openings so you can see. Anyway, um, during, during the heyday of, of the Cowboys, when they were playing in the uh, Super Bowl 28 against uh, Buffalo Bills, they, they had the media day on Tuesday, which the players hate, but you got to have access and, and carry the, the story. And so uh, usually the, the stars had a ton of people around them. Well, there is John Giesick, who, who was uh, filling in for Mark Stepnoski. Uh, he normally plays guard, but he's playing center in the Super Bowl. He's over there, and there's no one really talking with him. So one reporter walks up to John Giesick and is talking with him, and he says, how does it feel to be a nobody on a team full of stars? Well, John Giesick, you know, wanted to just lamb blast the guy, but instead he goes and he takes off his watch. He turns it over, and this is what he read on the back of it. To John, thanks for 1,563 yards and the 1991 rushing title, Emmett Smith. Whether this reporter recognized it or not, Emmett Smith recognized he wasn't going anywhere without John Giesick and the other guys on the offensive line, which are just incredible, blocking for him. But we have to realize we can't go it alone. Just us and God and this kind of spiritual thing going on. No, we need the body of believers to block for us, to, to help carry the ball, to help us grow and develop we have to realize that. The second thing we need to realize is the community will not be as God intended without you. If you're withholding your gifts, if God has blessed you in a certain way and you're kind of keeping everything at arm's length, the body can't thrive as God intended because God's given you a, an integral ingredient. And you all know when, when you're baking cake, if you leave out one or two things, it just changes. So we've got to have everyone in order to do this, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 talks about how that we're not on our own. We were bought at a price with God. But Paul comes back in Romans 12 and verse 5 and says, you're not alone. You're part of the body. You are a part of something larger than you. Everyone has a relationship with one another. So transformation takes place within community. One of the hardest things about uh, when a group of us went up to plant a church up in Connecticut, but there just weren't very many uh, Christians up there. In fact, at the time, ours was the seventh church that was planted in the entire state. <clears throat> Seven churches of Christ. In fact, we had some folks that were coming 45 minutes to an hour away, some up into Massachusetts that were traveling down across the border because we were, we were the nearest church of Christ to them. We didn't have a building. We were meeting at a, a public school in the science lab. And everything that, that we needed for church, for classes and, every, and worship, had to be packed out of a trailer and set up an hour before services got started. 
And then an hour afterwards, everyone stayed around and helped pack it back into the trailer. That's week in and week out because everything had to be set back in place for the science lab to go. Well, it, it was tough. And, you know, on the days that we did luncheons, uh, it was kind of interesting because we had crock pots that, that were plugged into the dissecting table there in the lab. And it was also the, the lectern. And it was also the place where we had the communion trays and everything else. But it was family. And it required everyone in the church to pull it off Everyone had a job, everyone contributed, and everyone had to work out their differences in order to live in community. Because there, there were no other alternatives. We were family. Though we knew it was hard, we came there for a reason. We knew we were on mission, and that was the essential ingredient that helped the fellowship to thrive. This week I hopped on the Yellow Pages online site. There are 29 churches of Christ in Huntsville alone. And depending on your tolerance level, there are many other churches out there as, as well. Is that a strength or is that a weakness? Well, it, it depends. I'm, I'm glad. I've said before that we're not McDonald's franchises. We're all different. I'm glad that there are different choices for folks. But depending on your tolerance for different things, there are many different options that we have out there so why stick around and work out your differences if it's just easier to start over? And, and why allow brothers and sisters into your life to confront you about some sin or some things that they see when you can just walk away and go right down the street? And if, if that's the mindset, what, what it does is it prevents us from going all in. It, it prevents us from saying, this is my church, this is my church family, Warts and all, that this is who we are, and I, I, I'm committed here. And it, it keeps us from allowing God to grow and mature us, to transform the church in the process. You know, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he also gives another list of, of various gifts and stuff that, that God has given to people. And he said, that the purpose of these gifts, you Ephesians, have been gifted so that the church here in Ephesus, the, the body of Christ, can be built up, can be unified, and can become more and more like Jesus. It, when you make that kind of commitment, Paul says, it moves you beyond infancy. It helps you to grow into maturity where you're not blown around by every whim or every different kind of teaching. Ephesians 4 and verse 15 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ." We become transformed when we are committed to community. You know, one of the great blessings of being part of this church is when I'm given the privilege of seeing various members display their passions and their convictions and their talents. I, I love on Sunday mornings in, in the summer, I know some of you teens go down there, watching uh, Amy and the children's ministry just light up there in the gym. And seeing so many talented people that I know have been working behind the scenes and those that are, that are working before the kids, seeing it all come and, and, and take place. I, I love walking into the fellowship various times during the year and sit down with family and, and, and enjoying good food. But th that took place because I know that there have been some folks that have been working back in the kitchen all day long so that we can enjoy 30 to 45 minutes of just fellowship with one another. I, I love coming in here once a month for the spring, and it, it's, it's incredible watching Lincoln and the praise team. And I know all the hours that they put in to preparing for that. But this is a time where I, I can just sit back and just worship God. I'm not on the program. I, I'm just there as a worshiper. And I'm, I'm so grateful for uh, the gifted people that pull that off, but also our gracious eldership that opened the door for that. I love going into the prayer tent at Outback and seeing that around the clock there's some people that care very much about inviting God into the process of changing people's lives and bringing about that transformation on that weekend. Just how concentrated a spiritual effort it is. I, I love going down to the Learning Center and day in and day out seeing the dedicated people that are cooking meals, that are tutoring, that are teaching, and basically telling these children, you're valuable, we care about you. I love seeing 50 or 60 people show up on a rainy Saturday to work on a widow's house. I love the feeling that when you can drop the trailer on the disaster relief and people start pulling out chainsaws 
And the guys and girls are saying, it's time to go to work. That's exciting. Seeing not only the ministry is taking place, but seeing the transformation that's going on. Seeing how God is helping people to use their, their passions and their gifts to bring about his glory, to expand his kingdom. But the growth that takes place as we participate in some of these things is exciting. What's the act set for us this morning? I'm going to leave that to Paul. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 18. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's his prescription. It's living life in community, allowing it to grow and, and transform people. If this is your church, if this is your family, Make it a community of transformation. Go in. Go, go in all with your love, with your gifts, with your passions. The invitation we offer to you today is Paul's call that he's given throughout Scripture and that we see no longer conforming to the world around us. We're being transformed into the image of Christ when we pursue holiness and pursue the path that God laid out for us. If you're ready to give your life to the Savior, I want to tell you, this is a place you can come where lives are transformed. If you're ready to, to put him on in baptism, it, it's ready for you. If you need the, the prayers of this community, we want transformation to happen in your life. If we can help you this morning, come now as we stand and as we sing. On bended knee, 